dive in? This is going to be a fun one tonight. Uh, Revelation, they're all fun, aren't they? The Bible's fun. They, the, some parts of the Bible are a little crazier than others, though. Uh, so we're going to dive in Revelation chapter 11. And if you've got your workbooks, page 51 in your workbooks. Um, I did get the new workbooks in, by the way. We ordered 10 more of them. So if uh, there's anybody that does not have their own copy, um, please, please let me know because I've got a few extras up here that we can use. Revelation chapter 11 and page 51 in your workbooks. But as you're turning there, I want to show you Matthew chapter 16. Just as a, a quick reminder tonight of, of why we're doing this. You know, why, I think it's important to pause every now and then when you go through a book of the Bible and say, you know, why, why this book? Why are we studying this particular you know, book of the Bible, this passage of Scripture? And I think Jesus gives us a good reminder here in Matthew chapter 16 when he says, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? And here's here's really what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you guys have paid such close attention to the sky, and and you can discern what the weather's going to be like, even tomorrow, just by looking up at the sky and just reading and, and... to, you know, getting little context clues, and, and that will help you learn how to live your life, right? If I, if I can look at the sky and see that it's going to storm tomorrow, I can get ready for rainy weather, right? I can make sure my umbrella's by the door. I can make sure to set out some, some clothes for the rainy weather. Knowing what the signs of the sky have to tell us about the, re- the weather helps us learn how to live our daily lives. And what he's saying is this. We should be able to look at the events that are happening around us in the world. We should be able to look at the events that are happening all around us and be able to discern them spiritually and understand, oh, here's kind of where we are in world history. Here's kind of what God's doing in Israel right now. And here's what God might be up to in our, in our world today so, so that we can discern the signs of the times so we know how to live our lives today. The point, listen, do not miss this. The point of Revelation is not to teach you about what will happen in the future. The point of Revelation is to teach you how to live today in light of the future. It should impact all of our lives today. So as we study tonight, we're going to look at future stuff, but that should impact the way we wake up and live tomorrow, just like knowing that it's going to rain tomorrow would impact your day. And so that's a good reminder for us as we study. This this is fun to talk about, but... We, we got to have that perspective. God, help me live differently in light of what we learn, right? So here's what I want us to do. Revelation chapter 11, I'm going to let you, either in your workbook on page 51 or in your Bible, I want you to read the first 14 verses, and I'm going to give you several minutes to do this. And I want you, in your workbook, down at the bottom of page 51 or in the margin somewhere, Write down three things in the first 14 verses that jump out at you. They could be, they, they could be things that you see. They could be a question that you have. Uh, it, could be, it could be anything. But just take your time, slow down, read through the verses, and in a few minutes, we'll just kind of share in dialogue before we jump into the teaching tonight. So just, just verses 1 through 14. Okay, who wants to start us off? What jumped out at you? What just kind of hit you right off the bat? Debbie. Okay, so it says two witnesses, and then it says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. What in the world are the olive trees and the lampstands all about? Yeah, absolutely. That, if there's one verse that seems out of place here, it's that verse. That's a great job. So, and, and remember, when we talk about Bible study, if you've gone through the How to Study the Bible course or if you've read the book, remember... A lot of Bible study and understanding scripture is really just about slowing down enough to notice and see what's in the passage. And this is one of those passages where there's a lot of details that if you read it too quick, you're going to miss really important stuff, right? So that's a good one. Give me something else. What else did you see? What jumped out at you? They're going to devour their enemies with fire. They will devour their enemies with fire. Could you imagine if God gave you that supernatural ability? Wouldn't that just be, you know? 
Your boss comes up to you. Why haven't you gotten back to my email? <laughs> you know, you just, just scorch him, you know? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you pull up beside them, just light their tires on fire. You know, there's a reason God didn't give that one to us, right? We are not spiritually mature enough to handle that. But these two witnesses, they will be able to breathe fire almost like a dragon. What else? They came back three days after they were They came back, so they will be killed, but they don't stay dead. Now, what's the reaction of the world when they're killed? They were thrilled, weren't they? So, so these two witnesses are witnessing about God, and then they're killed, and the whole world is excited. They're giving each other gifts like it's Christmas. They, they make it a holiday. And then three days later, the fire-breathing witnesses are back up. How scared would you be? I would be moving to a new town, <laughs> right? Faye, what did you have? I wanted to go back up to verse 2. Verse 2. We'll talk about that. That's the Gentiles. The Gentiles. Yes, that's the Gentiles. It's very, very good. So, yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that. That's actually a very important detail that once you study it, it, we'll pull a lot out of just that one phrase tonight. Very good. Give me a couple of other thoughts before we dive in. What jumped out to you? That was the second woe. That was just the second woe. Now, do you remember how many woes there are? There's three, and the three woes are announced at the end of chapter 8. So flip back in your Bible with me to chapter 8, and look with me at verse 13. So I had a sad day today. My Bible page fell out, so I'm just going to hold my Bible like this for right now, because it's right. I know, it's depressing, but it shows me that I've used this page a lot, so it's kind of encouraging, I guess. If you look at verse 13... It says, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's three woes. Well, once you get through uh, chapter 9, verse 12, if you take a look at chapter 9, verse 12, it says the first woe is past. And from chapter 9, verse 12, all the way up to chapter 11, that's all the second woe. So woe number two is pretty weighty, and woe number three is going to be even weightier than that, okay? So these woes that the eagle had pronounced, they're all starting to happen at this point. Very good. Give me one more thought. Why were they measuring? The temple? Yeah. We'll talk about that. That's, that's a great question. Why, why would we measure the temple? That is a fantastic question. Okay. You guys, you guys did good. I... For the next couple of weeks, we're going to do this because I think it's a good habit for us to get in. Let's read it together, look at it together, examine it together. Let me share with you a few things I gleaned in my study time just from Revelation chapter 11. So here's some context for you on page 51. You can start filling in these blanks. During the first half of John chapter, or Revelation chapter 11, John's interlude continues and it's going to give even more urgency to his hearers, his readers, and some clues as to what will happen in the second half of the tribulation. So I will remind you here, we're in the middle of the, the trumpet judgments, right? And we, we've just seen trumpet number six sound, and we're waiting for trumpet number seven. But in between trumpet number six and trumpet number seven, there's kind of this pause, this time out in the action, where God's going to show us some other stuff that he's doing during these trumpet judgments. And that's what we're looking at. And he's reminding us that even while he's pouring out his judgment in the end times, God's at work, isn't he? God's still working. He's not given up on mankind, even though he's starting to pour out his judgment. So remember, and this is really important here, Revelation is written in cyclical patterns, not chronological patterns. So people who read Re Revelation and they think chapter 1 just kind of goes like this all the way through the end times to chapter 22... That's not how it works. What's going to happen in Revelation is certain chapters are going to look at the end times from this point of view. Other chapters are going to look at it from that point of view. And, and so, so far, we've looked at the end times from heaven's perspective. Uh, we've looked at the end times from the earth's perspective. And in this chapter, we're going to look at the, the end times from the temple's perspective. What's going to happen in Jerusalem in the end times? That's what chapter 11 is all about. Now, next week, 
when we get into chapter 12, we're going to see the end times from Satan's perspective and from the Antichrist perspective. And we'll go all the way back to the beginning of the end times and we'll look at it all over again just from a different angle, okay? So Revelation, it's, it's not linear like this. It's, it, you're, you're kind of hopping around a little bit in the end times timeline, but from different angles, right? So we're looking at this from the perspective of the temple. Now, we, we had here as well, Debbie asked, why are we measuring the temple? Well, that's exactly what John is told to do in verse 1. It says, there was given to me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship it. But verse 2 is important because he says, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So all of this teaches us a couple of really important things. First and foremost, the temple in Jerusalem will one day be rebuilt. There is currently not a temple, right? Uh, if you go to the, the temple mount in Jerusalem, there's no temple there, right? The people, the, the Jewish people have not been offering sacrifices. There's, there hasn't been a temple since 70 AD when it was destroyed by the Romans. And Jesus foretells this in the Gospels. There hasn't been a temple that entire time. And so the Jewish people haven't had a building, a place in which to worship God. But we know that in the end times, this temple will be rebuilt. Now, do you remember who helps the Jews rebuild the temple? It's the Antichrist. Yeah. So one of the ways that the Antichrist is going to rise to power, we see this and, and we'll see more of this in the next chapter, is he's going to broker a peace treaty with Israel. And part of this peace treaty in Daniel chapter 9 tells us that the Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple on Temple Mount. And that's what we're talking about here. That's part of how he's going to rise to power. Now, is he going to uphold his treaty? No, he's going he's gonna to do them dirty, isn't he? And so that's part of what we'll see in the next chapter as well. Now, the Jews already, this is just some modern day context, they already have plans to rebuild the temple, but there's one problem. The place where the temple must be built is currently being used to worship Allah. If you go to Temple Mount today, you cannot pray. If they see you praying to Jesus, you will be shot on sight. Like it is, there, is a, there is no warning. <laughs> you don't get two strikes. You, you, you are in big, big trouble, okay? Uh, and so that is actually uh, the location of a mosque where they, that they have built because the Muslims also believe that Temple Mount is a sacred location. They believe that this is a place from which Muhammad ascended into heaven. And so they've claimed temp Temple Mount as well. And so during a peace treaty that was done back in the day, an Israeli secretary of state gained access, gained control over the Israeli area, but he forfeited control of Temple Mount. And so to this day, that secretary of state, every statue in Israel that has ever been proposed, they've shot down for that individual because they gave away the one thing that matters most, which is what, what do we do with the temple? Well, you gave that away to the Muslim authorities. And so they no longer have control over Temple Mount. Now, this is a really good reminder for us. This isn't in your notes, but you can write it down. We've seen this over and over, haven't we? Everything God does, Satan counterfeits. So God has a sacred special place, right? This is, this is the place where I'm going to be worshipped in Jerusalem. This is the, the place, the location of the temple. This is the place that was purchased by King David and where King Solomon built the temple that we were reading about in 1 Chronicles on Sunday. This is that place where they offered sacrifice and, and bowed down to worship me and prayed and poured out their hearts to me. And Satan's going to come across and say, well, I want that place too. God, you can't have that place. I want it too. And so he's going to raise up a false religion, Islam, with false gods and false prophets, and, and he's going to claim that same thing. We saw, we saw Satan do this with the rainbow, right? There's a rainbow around the throne of God in heaven. We saw it in Revelation chapter 4. What is on the pride flag? What is the symbol of Satan's influence in this world? A rainbow. He hijacked it. Well, he's hijacking Temple Mount. But one day the temple will be rebuilt. Now, one of the, 
the implications here is that, again, most Bible scholars believe the temple will be built during the first half of the tribulation while there's still peace on the earth. Remember, things, things break loose in the second half of the tribulation, that second three and a half years. The first three and a half years is really pretty peaceful. And the Antichrist is consolidating power. He's rising to power. And the temple will be rebuilt during that season. And this is one reason why the Jews will be duped into thinking the Antichrist is the Messiah at first. Because he's the guy that let them build their temple after how many years? Right? This guy is going to be a hero to the Jewish people. We know, I mean, we know the story. He's the Antichrist. But, at, I mean, think about it. If, if you couldn't go to church for thousands of years and suddenly some politician gave you the right to go back to church, you would think he was pretty hot stuff, right? And that's what's going to happen here. And the Jews will only figure this out when he commits what's called the abomination of desolation. We'll talk about that in just a couple of chapters. So one of the things, though, we see here is that, again, the, John is going to measure the temple. Now, I want to show you a little, a little bit of why that is. There's two reasons, okay? The first one is this. Temple Mount is large enough where the mosque that currently exists on Temple Mount there is still some room off to the side where you could still build the full temple to its biblical specifications, and there's enough room for both to exist in the same location. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. It might not be what happens, but there is currently enough room. In addition to that, the Jewish people, they already have all of the artifacts, you know, like the golden menorahs and the, you know, the things with, you know, for burning incense, Everything that they need, all of the artifacts that would fill the temple, they already have made them. And they're just kind of sitting in, in storage right now, waiting for the temple to be rebuilt. And they can, they can fill the temple and start using it as soon as it's built. All they need is permission to build, and there is enough room. So the implication is, as soon as this treaty is brokered, it will, construction's going to begin quick. I don't think the temple's going to be a 20-year project. Okay? The, I think they're going to slam this thing up quick, and they'll do it right, don't get me wrong, but the Jewish people are eager to worship God through sacrifice. And once this is, this is an option, they'll go for it quickly. So they want to start doing sacrifices? They do, yes. The Jewish people want to institute sacrifices again. Now, why is that? Somebody help me out. They don't believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. So why don't we sacrifice today as Christians? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the sacrifice once and for all. His, his blood was shed for the remission of all sins, right? So we don't sacrifice today because this sacrifice was enough. You don't need any more sacrifice. But if the Jewish people don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, which they don't by and large... Uh, don't, don't get me started. <laughs> Why not? You, you, know, you know what's fascinating, Debbie, is there's a, there's a Jewish political commentator named Ben Shapiro. Anybody listen to Ben Shapiro? He's, he's Jewish, one of the sharpest minds in our generation. Whether you like what he says on politics or not, the guy is, is really sharp, okay? And he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And, and he's talked with John MacArthur. He's talked with Jordan Peterson, some of these guys that like they're convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And they're like, Ben, how do you miss this? Like put the, connect the dots, buddy. And he's like, I just, I just don't see it that way. And so they have been duped. Now the Bible actually talks about this. In fact, if you want to write this down, Debbie, you can write down uh, Romans chapters eight and nine. Uh, in fact, you could even add chapter 10 in there. It's mostly chapter 9, where the Bible talks about how Israel turned away from God so that God would bring the Gentiles in, okay? So Israel has forsaken God, and God has now taken the gospel to the nations. That's what you see in the book of Acts. Now all the nations, including us, we're Gentiles, right? And so we, we have come close to Christ so that Israel will now, in the end times, come back later, okay? So all of this is actually a part of God's plan, uh, their ignorance, their, their inability to kind of connect those dots. God's using that. Uh, but when the temple's rebuilt, they'll institute sacrifices because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, we're going right back to the Old Testament once that happens. 
it's, yeah, it'll be, it'll be wild. I can only imagine what PETA will have to say on that day. Amen. Faye. That is a great question. Eric's nodding his head. So what, if we haven't had sacrifices since 70 AD, you know, let's say you got a 65-year-old Jewish man who's never been able to make a sacrifice in his life, how are his sins covered? How are his sins atoned for? Um, that's a great question. If you go up to a Jewish man or a Jewish lady and you were to ask them that question, what they would tell you is, we believe that the sincerity of our faith covers us for now until sacrifices can be resumed. Which, again, they're so close, aren't they? The, the sincerity of faith covers us. It's like, well, faith in what? Sacrifice. No, it should be faith in Jesus, right? So they're so, they're so close, but their faith is in the wrong thing. And, and can we call time out here for a second? It's really important who or what you put your faith in. Their faith is in sacrifice. They have a lot of faith in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. You can have a lot of faith, but if your faith is in the wrong thing, your faith is going to let you down. If I'm, what's that? It's going to God, but they don't believe the Messiah has come yet. So they read the Old Testament. These are great questions about the Jewish people. Love this. Uh, they read the Old Testament and they know that, that God in the Old Testament, he promises a Messiah will come who will, who will make all things right and he will reign on the throne of David forever. They don't think Jesus was that Messiah. They think that Messiah has yet to come and they're still looking for the Messiah when they, they missed it. Okay? And, So everything that the, what, what was the shortcoming in Jesus? This is, this is covered a lot in the book of Acts. In fact, let's, let's just go there. Go to, go to Acts chapter 4. You guys are asking great questions tonight. Acts chapter 4. Bless you. What's that? I'm going to start not quite there. So that there's really, really Acts chapter 2 through 4. Um, I want to I look, though, at verse 8. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and he's talking to the religious leaders who crucified Jesus here, okay? He's talking to the guys who made sure he was nailed to a cross. Rulers and elders of the people, verse 9, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, but by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. So right there, you've got it. Peter and John heal the lame man, and they get hauled in front of the religious council, and they said, well, who did you do this, and whose authority did you heal this guy? What a, what a silly question, right? Why aren't you saying, wow, I'm really amazed that happened? Who do you, who do you believe in, Right? And instead, they're like, how dare you heal a lame man? How dare you do something kind? And so they tell the religious leaders, it was, it was Jesus' authority. The same Jesus you had nailed to a cross. The same Jesus that you couldn't stand because he called you hypocrites. The same Jesus that you didn't want to listen to because you thought that he was equating himself with God. Because he is God, that, that same Jesus that you crucified, God raised him from the dead and he's the Messiah. They told them flat out, even if they missed it and made a mistake by nailing Jesus to the cross, it was explained to them later, hey, you all done screwed up. He was the Messiah. You should believe in him. But there's something here called pride. And that pride is keeping these religious leaders. They don't want to be called out for being the people that crucified the Messiah, God's chosen man. And so they kind of do a big cover up. 
to be honest with you. And the, the gospel spreads anyway. All of Jerusalem, later in, in chapter 5, it says all of Jerusalem is filled with the teaching about Jesus. But those who didn't want to see it chose not to see it because it made them look bad. And, and that hindered a lot of the Jewish people from following Jesus. Any other questions on that? Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they, that's the cover-up. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 18, they solemnly charge them, don't go preaching in the name of Jesus anymore. Don't tell people about Jesus. Quit it. And they go out and tell people about Jesus anyway. Um, even the first Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7 is Stephen. And if you read Acts chapter 7, S Stephen goes through the whole Old Testament and shows them very clearly that Jesus is the Messiah, and they turn around and kill him. And he's the first Christian to die for the faith. And so part of it, Abrian, like why did, why did the Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah? Originally, it was because he made himself out to be God, and they found that blasphemous. Because if he's not God, it is blasphemous. But they missed all the, the, the miracles, and they missed his teaching, and they weren't looking for the kind of Messiah that Jesus truly is. They wanted someone to free them from the Roman Empire. He, he came to set up a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom, and they missed that. And, and so they killed him. But afterwards, there's a cover-up, and there's pride, and there's arrogance that kind of hardens their hearts to the point where they decide, even if he is the Messiah, I'm still not going to believe in Jesus, is basically about where they get. And the Jewish people have kind of perpetrated that same error in large part all the way up to the present day. And only when the abomination of desolation happens will they realize, because all of this is being foretold in the New Testament as well, they'll realize that not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament is true too, including the Gospels, including the part where Jesus dies on the cross for their sins. And that's, that's going to change everything in the end times for Israel. I agreed. Yeah, it. yeah. That, that's still such a today. It is. You, you... Not the Roman Empire, but you know, <laughs> Jesus doesn't fit into, he doesn't do what I need him to do for me, then he must not be Jesus. He must not be sufficient. And, and that, Abraham, that is the, that's one of the biggest reasons, I think, why people come to church is because they are in a hard spot and they're looking for Jesus to do something in their life, like fix my marriage, God, I gotta get back in church now, or shucks, I've got financial difficulties, or my kid's messed up and now I gotta try to get my relationship back with my kid, and then if God doesn't come through with what they wanted him to do, it's like, well, God doesn't, it's not real, Christianity doesn't work, and it's like you were looking for the wrong kind of thing. Um, you can have... You can have all the faith in the world, but if it's in the wrong thing, it will let you down. And you have to know the role of who you're putting your faith in. Jesus did not come to set the Jewish people free from Rome. He came to set everyone free from sin and to save us from God's wrath. Okay, It's like if I'm, if I'm out on the water and I'm swimming and I'm starting to get tired, I can have all the faith in the world that holding on to an anchor will help me, but an anchor is not going to help me. If I clutch onto an anchor, I'm going down to the bottom with it, right? All the faith in the world's not going to help me because I'm not putting my faith in the right thing, and I'm also not asking it to do what it does. Anchors don't float. So you, you got to have your faith in Jesus, and not the Jesus you want, the Jesus that he is, because that's the Jesus you need. And so come to Jesus, yes, asking him to do all sorts of things for you, but understand that what God wants to do in you might not be what you want him to do. And this is why God says no to our prayers sometimes, right? I mean, I've prayed so many things in the past and said, well, God, if you really love me and if you're going to, you know, if you really hear our prayers, you're going to do this. 
And God says, no, I want to do something totally different in your heart. I don't want to change your circumstances. I want to change you, Ben. I don't, I don't want to change your wife, Kara. I want to change you as a husband, right? I, I don't want to change your financial situation by helping you win the lottery. I want to change the way you look at your money in the first place so that you see that I own it all and not you. God changes you. He's got a different plan a lot of times than what you think he does. But that plan is ultimately best. And that's, that's the part we have to hang on to. Any other thoughts or questions? Hey, can I just one yeah, hop in. I, I believe that the Jewish, just like the Muslim matter there, have been established for so long. It's a culture, they call it a lifestyle. Rather than like us, it's a faith that causes a lifestyle. Yeah. Yes, it's the rule. It's like a flow. Yeah. So their faith is not ruling their lifestyle like ours is supposed to. Be. Right. Yeah. And the Jews are still putting their trust in the law. They still adhere to dietary restrictions, dress restrictions, yep. head covering restrictions. Yeah. They don't have any trust in Jesus' blood. It's in the law. Yeah. They're still living fully under the Old Testament, almost as if the New Testament doesn't exist. That's, that's where they are. Exactly. Yeah. Catherine. Right. They have faith in the sacrifice that they need to make, not, not mm -hmm. faith in Jesus. Um, but the difference between the Jewish faith and the Christian faith is really and truly relationship with Jesus. You know, because yes. they can't have that relationship, but a Christian can have a relationship, and that's how, in my opinion, Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the relationship dynamic in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, totally different, right? Yeah. In, in the Old Testament, he's a corporate God. He's the God of Israel, the nation, right? So in the New Testament, he's, our, he's my God. And he's not just God, he's my father. That changes. Like when Jesus says, pray in this way, our father that's, that's a game changer. For us, it's second nature, but for them, totally different. Um, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This is another good one to kind of think through as we think about the sacrificial system. And, and by the way, the book of Hebrews is one of the most theologically dense books in the entire Bible. It's, it's a book that I started studying a few years ago, and I quit because I wasn't ready for it yet. It was one of those. Um, so... Tackle that one at your own risk. Uh, but the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish people who had converted to Christianity. They had started to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. However, they had some peer pressure to go back to the sacrifices. And so the author of Hebrews basically says, no, no, no. If you believe in the shed blood of Jesus, there shouldn't be any more shed blood in your life. It, he paid for all your sins. You don't need any more sacrifices. And so there's this tension, going back to the cultural stuff you're talking about, Rick, they had a hard time leaving the culture behind because everybody else is doing the sacrifices, everybody else is going to the synagogues, everybody else is doing the Old Testament thing, and here I am believing in Jesus as this Jew that became a Christian, and now I'm an outcast, well, can't I have Jesus and still sacrifice too? And that's the tension here in the book of Hebrews, okay? Uh, take a look with me in, in chapter 10. Watch this in verse, oh, let's start in verse 11. Every priest stands daily. Now, notice the word stands. The one thing priests could never do is sit down because they always had more sacrifices to make. That was an on your feet, running around kind of job. They stand daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away what? Sins. Sins. So, so the word atonement in the Bible literally means to cover, okay? So if I got a tarp and I, and, I and I covered this table, would it take the table away? It's covered, you won't see it, but it's still there, right? 
The sacrifices of the Old Testament, they could cover sins with innocent blood. They could not remove sins. Does that make sense? Jesus' sacrifice does something different. He says, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the... He doesn't cover them only. He covers them and he removes them. They're not yours anymore. You're not chained to them. Jesus' sacrifice was greater. Does that make sense? Keep reading with me. Verse 12, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for how long? For all time. What did he do? He sat down. Why? Because he was done working. He was finished. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. I don't have any more sacrifices to do. And guess what? You don't either. <laughs> we don't have to go kill our lambs. No turtle doves, right? Why? Because the one sacrifice of Jesus was enough. So he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Now, let's go to where Catherine was talking about how does that change your relationship? Well, look with me. Verse 19. So what's the implication? Jesus is one sacrifice. How does it change the relationship? Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, what's the one place they couldn't go into? The holy place. That was for the priests. The people couldn't go into the holy place. That was a place for the, pe for the priests. But where, where can we go now? We can go into the holy place by the what? Blood. By the blood of Jesus, by a sacrifice. That's why when he hung on the cross, the temple was torn in two. It was God's way of symbolizing, I'm now giving you access to all of me. This isn't just for the high priest on the day of atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. You can all now come into my presence unfiltered anytime you want to by faith in the one sacrifice of Jesus. So that's why we don't have to make an appointment to pray with God. Like, think about it. If, if you were a regular person under the Old Testament, you don't really go to God. You have to go to your priest, and your priest makes the sacrifice for you. You don't have a direct connection. Not really. You and I have the direct connection, friends. That's how the sacrifice of Christ is better. And, and again, it... The, and, and again, none of this is to mock or to belittle the Jewish people. Again, they do have great faith. They do have the Old Testament. We're thankful for the nation that came from Abraham, right? The, the nation that produced the Messiah, that God did choose. However, they're going to miss it up until the abomination of desolation, and they, they aren't going to wake up until that moment. Their eyes will be darkened. Their hearts will be hardened. The Bible talks about this, and there will not be faith in Jesus until, until God opens their eyes. And that's part of why all of this is happening in the book of Revelation. Remember, God's not just, he's not just pouring out his judgment on the earth. He's also trying to wake up Israel. And you'll see that in chapter 12 in a big, big way. Okay? Any other thoughts on sacrifices? We can study the whole book of Leviticus tonight if you want. End of verse 26. End of verse 26. Read it for us. Yeah, there, there's no more need of another sacrifice. That's it. That's it. There, there is no other sacrifice needed. Now, why is John measuring the temple? Well, let me give you a couple of passages to write down. You can write down first and foremost, uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3. And in your notes, you can also write down Zechariah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Both of those passages talk about a measuring rod being given to somebody. And here's what they're measuring. Me measurement was done for two reasons in the Old Testament. Number one, it was, it was done to figure out the length and the width and the height of something, of course. That's why we measure things. It was typically done, however to signify ownership. You measured what you owned. You didn't measure somebody else's stuff. Um, this is, this, by the way, this is why David gets in trouble in the Old Testament. You guys remember the story where David takes up a census of the people of Israel? Right? He, he didn't just mess up with, with Bathsheba. A little bit later in his kingdom, he, he decides, I'm going to count. I'm going to take a census of all the people of Israel. 
The problem is the Old Testament says you don't count what doesn't belong to you. And God says, David, these people aren't yours, they're mine. David, these aren't, these aren't your subjects, they're my subjects. David, you're out of line for counting these people. They don't belong to you. You don't measure what doesn't belong to you, David. And so David had to choose from three punishments. And I think he chose like a three-day pestilence that just came through and wiped out the people of the land, okay? And so you don't measure, you don't count what doesn't belong to you. The idea here is this. God's saying the temple still belongs to me. So John, go measure it. Go measure, but just measure the part that the Jewish people go into. He says in verse two, leave out the court. That's where the Gentiles would go. They call it the court of the Gentiles. Why? Because the nations will trample under their feet for three and a half years. 42 months. And again, we're seeing some of that with the Muslim rule over the Dome of the Rock and the Temple Mount right now. They're trampling underfoot God's holy city and the sacred site of the temple, right? So we're, we're seeing that today. Now, let me give you a little bit more context, a couple more blanks here. If the temple was built in the space available, this is just an interesting little tidbit for you, okay? Not saying this is going to happen, but this is just some interesting stuff that all lines up. If it's built in the space available, it would be directly across from the eastern gate. Now, that's an important gate because when Jesus comes back at the second coming, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives during, during the Battle of Armageddon, and he's going to come through the eastern gate into Jerusalem. And everybody knows this. It's clear as day in the book of Ezekiel. So what happened? Well, there's a Muslim leader who read that and decided, you know what? I'm gonna make sure their little Messiah can't get through the Eastern Gate. So if you go to Jerusalem, that gate is sealed shut. You can't get through it. Problem is, he's dealing with Jesus, right? Jesus is gonna be just fine at getting through that gate, right? He's gonna come down to the Mount of Olives, and I don't know if he's gonna like do some kind of Casper the Magic Ghost kind of thing and go right through the wall. I don't know if he's just gonna like C4 TNT, just blow the thing up, but he's gonna go through that Eastern Gate and he's gonna ride into Jerusalem and the, and the Battle of Armageddon is gonna be totally different after he shows up, right? So, so, but again, see that they take this seriously. Like they're trying to block out some of these prophecies so that the Messiah can't fulfill them, but you, you can't stop God from fulfilling his prophecies, okay? Now, John, again, he's only told to measure the part of the temple that the Jews would enter into because the Gentile areas are going to be trampled underfoot for 42 months, or again, that's that three and a half years, which is the second half of the tribulation where things get really, really bad. And what's going to happen during that second half of the tribulation? Well, the Antichrist, like we said, he's gonna break his peace treaty with Israel. He's gonna stop the sacrificial system. So almost as soon as the Jews can start sacrificing again, he's gonna come in and put a stop to them. This is only, they're only gonna be able to sacrifice for a short while. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna walk into the Holy of Holies. He's gonna set himself up on a throne and say, guys, now you sacrifice to me. I'm God. And that's when the Jews are gonna have their eyes open and they're gonna say, wait a minute, this guy's not our friend, he's our foe. This guy's, not, this guy's not on our side, he's actually on the side of the enemy. And that's when all of this is going to start making sense. We did miss the boat on this. And so we'll cover this more, like I said, in chapter 13, which deals with the Antichrist. So that's, that's where we're gonna stop tonight because we're gonna get into the two witnesses next. And there's a lot of content on those two witnesses. I don't wanna just necessarily start that and then leave you hanging. Um, but we do have a little bit of time for any more questions or comments specifically on the, on the Jewish people, on the temple being rebuilt, a anything else you want to flesh out on any of those concepts tonight? A little bit of a different one, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so that is one of the biggest reasons why people, a lot of Christians believe Christians will be raptured 
at the beginning of the tribulation is so that when he does this, the very people who would know that won't be here. So that's a very good argument for the pre-tribulation rapture that a lot of you hold to, right? Um, and so I, I don't know. You know, if we are here, I'm sure we'll be screaming loud and proud, hang on, everybody, he's the Antichrist, don't trust him. Uh, but I, I don't think, I, it wouldn't shock me if we're not here and nobody's here really to warn them. No, it's not their scriptures. Yeah, their, their Bible ends with the last book of the Old Testament. For them, it's Second Chronicles. Um, no, they won't, know, they won't know a lot of this. So, but yeah, you would think that somebody somewhere would try to say something. And I'm sure some people will, but they'll be so excited. I mean, think about it. They'll be so tickled that they're getting their temple back. They might say, I don't care. I just want my temple back so I can sacrifice. I haven't been able to make a sacrifice for my sins. This could be the difference between heaven and hell for me if I can get my sins covered, you know? So for them, you've got to look at it from that Old Testament perspective. You know, they, they're going to look at it like it's a game changer for them when the reality is it's, it's not. So, yeah. Yeah, trying to don't believe, but you right, trying to box out a God that you don't think is real. Right. Yeah, it's like it's like those atheists, like Richard Dawkins. Like you, you spend a lot of time arguing against something you don't think is even real. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a little concerning, buddy. It's like it's like going on debates to talk about the boogeyman. <laughs> like uh, we all know he's not real, guys. Yeah, you don't need debates on it. Okay. Right. It has come to them. They received Jesus. Right. But I can't imagine how sad it is to see. Well, I can. You you can. Yeah. People all around us in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. But I I do I do know what you mean because if anybody should be able to get it on paper, it should be the Jewish people because they have the Old Testament. They lived the Old Testament. You know. Um, so if anybody should be able to get it, it would be the Jewish people. But their, their minds are just darkened to the truth. And, I, you know, there are Jews who have trusted in Jesus. They're Christians, will worship Jesus in heaven with them. And that, that is difficult for them to interact because they're almost, in a sense, kind of shunned from their community. Like, they don't go to the synagogues. They'd, obviously, they wouldn't offer sacrifices if they could. A lot of them are under grace, which is the New Testament, so they'll eat pork. <laughs> and it's like, you know, their families don't go along with that. It's not kosher. So there's, there's some disconnects there. But again, that's true for all of us, right? Uh, if you've trusted in Jesus, um, if you've trusted in Jesus, then if you've got unsaved family members, there's a disconnect there for you, and you know what that's like. And sometimes Thanksgiving's hard. You know, sometimes Christmas is difficult just because of that, so... Yeah, you should have answered it, Brenda. Should have put him on speakerphone and said, hey, welcome to Bible study. Should bring it up here and let me talk to him. I'll invite him. We'll wrap up with Catherine and then we'll, then we'll close. Yeah, yeah. I still haven't yet. You know, my yeah. Best friend kept telling me, Kevin, you need to watch it. I, I'm going to tell you, it really opened my eyes to just to try to better imagine. Mm -hmm. Because I can't imagine, you know, I, I don't have any baseline to imagine what it could have been like for um, all the Know, right. Some of whom, some of whom were devout Jews, to turn. Yeah. Basically. Like yeah, they, they did. Turn, yeah. Um, and start believing in Jesus. And, yeah. And when you watch that program, it gives you a realism that, like, man. Changed. 
changed everything. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Because I know I, I can see You can you can visualize it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that it is real, that it was real. Yeah. So it's not just a story on paper. You can no, 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 yeah. No. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty and I and I again I have not watched The Chosen. Uh from what I hear it's really well done, especially for don't take this the wrong way. Christian things can be kind of lame and corny, right? This is not that. Um, and so I, I hear they did like a tremendous job of just portraying as biblically faithfully as they can. And so, yeah, even though I haven't watched it and don't feel like I can personally recommend it, I've heard enough of you recommend it that I would say if you haven't watched it, do better than me and start watching it, right? Um, to what you said before we wrap up, Matthew chapter 19 is the story of the rich young ruler. And remember, the rich young ruler goes to Jesus and says, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And uh, Jesus says, well, you keep the commandments. And he said, well, which ones? And so Jesus lists out, you know, and he, he says, well, I've kept all those since my youth. What more do I need to do, Jesus? And Jesus says to him, take everything you've got, sell it, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler went away sad because he had many possessions, and he wasn't willing to leave behind everything for Jesus. Now, right after that, I want you to listen to what Peter says. Right after that, verse 27, then Peter said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What will there be for us? Peter says, we left behind our families. We, we did leave our boats and our nets. We, like, we, we did leave our kids if they had any. We, we left it all behind to follow you. What, is there a reward for us? Here's what Jesus says. Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the millennial reign of Christ that we'll talk about later in Revelation. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Is it worth it to give up what we have in this world to follow Jesus? All day, every day, and twice on Sundays. Amen? So let's, let's keep leaving all behind to follow him. Anything he asks you to give up, he's got something better for you. Right? Trust him in that. So good, good thoughts tonight. We'll pick up with the two witnesses next week. We are going to end three minutes early the Lord is good. There are miracles that do happen. Wait. Every time I read that scripture, I think to myself, the first mistake that young man made was, what must I do? And yeah. I couldn't do anything. He couldn't do it all. Yeah. None of us can. No. None of us can. Miss Pat, would you close us in prayer tonight? I, I really appreciate I it. Thank you.